Our Sabres and NHL analyst, Paul Hamilton, joining me now. Paul, we have seen two beautiful hockey games uh, in the past two days on Channel 2 um, in the East Division. And both of those games between the Caps and the Bruins and the Penguins and the Islanders going to overtime, what does that show you about how tough this East Division really was? Yeah, a lot of people are talking about Colorado and Vegas that, you know, they're the cup favorites and they're very good teams. I mean, don't get me wrong. They absolutely could win the Stanley Cup. But I think a lot of people are ignoring this East Division and the team, any one of the four teams could get out of it, even though two teams are obviously down one game to none now, but any one of the four could get out. Quite honestly, I think the team that gets out, in my mind, might be the favorite. I think they might be the most well-rounded team. Now, if you pin me down, I would say Boston probably, I would say, might be the team that would get out. But it could be any of them. And the reason the East Division team doesn't have the record of Colorado or doesn't have the record of Vegas is because they beat They're up all beating on each up other. on each other. Yeah. yeah. And the Vegas odds drive so much conversation but the Vegas odds, they can't bet on a team in the East when who's going to come out of the East because all four of these teams are capable. So when you look at the Vegas odds, you look at Vegas Insider, it's uh, the third most likely team is the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I, I don't see that happening to win the Stanley Cup, but they can't put any of these teams in the East in the odds because they can beat each other. Well, you and I weren't alive the last time that Maple Leafs got goaltending in the playoffs. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's you sure you that... aren't, <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that, you know, has haunted them. Carrie price gets hot. They might even not get past Montreal. You know, who knows? It, you know, Carey price is quite capable of getting hot and that could really stone the, the Maple Leafs and a team that we haven't even talked about the defending champs, Tampa Bay. Very often, the defending champs just kind of hang out. That's what Tampa Bay did this year. They were good enough that they got in. And they're right now the eighth-ranked team. If you took the standings from 1 to 16 of the playoff teams, they're number eight. But they're just kind of hanging out there. Florida Panthers played very well. Carolina played very well. So it's not going to be a cakewalk, but they know how to get through things. So I'm not discounting Tampa Bay either. Uh, getting through their division, but I just think people are really not looking at the East hard enough. Who is your Stanley Cup favorite? Whoever comes out to the East and like, uh, even so, who is it? Yeah, probably Boston. I, I think they're, they're, they're the, I think they're the best equipped to get out of the East. Yeah. I think they blew a golden opportunity in game one though, against the Capitals. Craig Anderson comes in. He's an average you have to win that game. best. Yeah. And he's played, what, three games all year? And he gets to come in because of an injury early in the game. And the Bruins didn't take advantage of that. You know, they let him get some confidence in there. He's a veteran goaltender, so he knows how to keep himself ready. And they let him get some confidence in that. And they wound up losing the game. Now, of course, Laviolette isn't going to tip his hand on his goaltending. Samsonov just, or Samsonov just getting back to practice. So he probably isn't ready. So it looks like Anderson probably will get game two also. And the Bruins must take advantage of that. Craig Anderson does have that experience, though, in the playoffs. It's not like you're just kind of throwing somebody in there. Um, but, you know, this East Division has been so difficult. Um, the Sabres, obviously, at the bottom of it. And I think that was probably hard on the Devils, too, um, having a lot of young players trying to develop them in this division and playing these guys, like these heavy hitters, night after night after night in a condensed schedule. Um, how do you think the Sabres would have fared in another division? Oh, I don't think they would have made the playoffs with, right, with the way they yeah. played. Because they still would have had to go against Tampa Bay and Florida and Toronto and Montreal. Ottawa was at times better this year. I mean, yeah, they would have had Detroit and Ottawa with them, but still would have had to compete with those teams. And they didn't rescue the Sabres with another coach fast enough that they would have been able to compete with that. But I think after Granado took over 
And not only we've talked many times about how the younger players got better, but they got better against good teams who were fighting for something. The Bruins were fighting. The Islanders were fighting. All those teams, even the Rangers at the time the Sabres were playing, were still trying to get into the playoffs. So those teams that they were playing had something to play for. And they were winning some of those games. So it was very, very good experience for Cousins and Middlestat and Thompson and all the, the whole group of youngsters that got a chance to play. Are you ready to open the can of worms? <laughs> Always. Michael, last week, um, the comments he made to us, I, I, I mean, it all seemed like he wants out of this organization. Um, he and Kevin Adams had very, I would say different things to say, although Kevin Adams did not deny that the team did not want Jack to have surgery. And Jack said he wanted to have surgery after you pressed him on that. Um, is there any way for this to be um, repairable? I think there's only one way. It doesn't look like really it can be repairable. If by chance the Sabres don't get a decent trade offer, and I think he will be difficult to trade. Now, there's some insiders that have gone on radio station that have said he's untradeable. Others have gone on our radio station and say he is tradable. And these are all top NHL insiders. So, but if they don't get the offer they want, he could be in Buffalo next year playing for the Sabres. The only way I think it could be repairable is if the Sabres play well under, if Don Granado is a coach or whoever the coach is, they make the playoffs, and then he would be, I think, a much happier camper then after a full season of that. You know, oh, look at this team. We made some good moves. Our youngsters are really advancing. We made the playoffs, or we were in the playoff hunt to the last day or something like that. I think that would be the only way you could possibly, and I'm saying possibly, salvage this thing. Other than that, I don't see any other way. Yeah, and um, other um, older, per se, players who are, you know, much younger than us, but uh, Reinhardt, Ristolainen, um, said they are not willing to be a part of a rebuild here if they lose jack they do need to rebuild so how much are they going to need to rebuild because they're going to lose other veteran players who played well for them this season yeah in eichel's case at least you have a contract so you're not going to lose them for free right whereas in ristoline and reinhardt situations they reinhardt is a restricted free agent this year and if he plays one on a one-year contract, will be unrestricted the next year. And Ristolainen has a contract with one more year. He also would be unrestricted the next year. In both cases, I don't think their value is any higher or has been any higher than it is right now. Reinhardt with a career year, as I thought Ristolainen had his best year. So I think their value is now. I don't think Reinhardt wants any part of Buffalo, the Sabres, or anything else. He wants to get out of here. I don't think there's any question about that. Ristolainen, I think I could say the same thing I said about Eichel. He told us, I want to make the playoffs, whether it's here or someplace else. Next year, I need exact to make the thing. playoffs. He said the exact same thing. It, it was almost word for word. Right. Yeah. So, all right, let's say the Sabres have him for the one more year. They didn't trade him, and they make the playoffs. I think he'd be perfectly fine staying in Buffalo. So, you know, I think it's just two different situations. I think Reinhardt wants to play on the West Coast. I don't think he he likes Buffalo. I don't I don't think there's anything he likes. I mean, that's just the way he is. And I think he wants to move on. But Mr. Lyon, as I said, if you play well, make the playoffs, I think he, he might be interested in signing a contract after that. What do you think is the difference between Reinhardt and Bristol Linen in that regard? I'm curious. I think just Reinhardt's through with Buffalo. I think he's through with everything about it, the Sabres, everything. Um, where Ristolainen, as he said, and I, I think he was being very truthful. He goes, I told Kevin Adams, if you want me to play my last year of the contract, great, I'll play. If you want to trade me, great, that's fine too. Whatever you want is fine. You know, he, now, that one year means he becomes an unrestricted free agent, and if they didn't make the playoffs again, I think he's already told us, I, don't, I need to make the playoffs, so he would be out of here. 
So I, I think in those in, in those two cases, I think you really do need to find a very good deal this off season. As I said, their value is going to be higher than it's ever been. I don't think you want to take them into that. You definitely don't want to give Reinhardt a one year deal and give him that option of being an unrestricted free agent after that. And quite honestly, that might be the only thing he would sign is a one year deal. I yeah. mean, if they, I mean, they got to qualify him, give him a qualifying offer. If they give him a qualifying offer, he might agree to it. And so he can be unrestricted the next year, play one more year and be unrestricted. So I just wouldn't give him that, that option. I, you know, I would definitely be looking to move him and not because of his play. It's because of the situation where you don't want to lose him for free for nothing. I mean, certainly you've got to replace his 25 goals. This is a player that's produced the whole time here. If he'd be willing to sign a four a three or four or a five year deal. Now we're having a whole different conversation. I don't think he's willing to do that though. How much does that hurt? How much do their comments hurt Kevin Adams in his quest this off season to trade these guys and get as much as he can? Because other GMs know that these guys aren't happy. They do, but the, the Adams doesn't have to trade them. And that's the thing. It's not, it doesn't have to be done this off season. In Eichel's case, people have tried to make the case with me that he did this whole thing so the Sabres can't trade him this year and he would play one more year with Buffalo and then his no movement clause would kick in and he, like Taylor Hall had, would be able to dictate where he would be traded to. So the whole thing was orchestrated by he and his agent to make the say make it almost impossible for the Sabres to trade or make it as difficult as possible so he could put that one more year in and do that do I necessarily agree with that it's possible I suppose maybe but I, I don't know I, I I just don't know if that was the case there and I still think he is a tradable commodity now but as I, I told Adam Benini earlier in the week you just don't give him away you just don't say well, we want Byfield from the Kings and the Kings say, well, no, he, we're not going to put him in the, in the deal. Okay. You hang up the phone. All right, we'll figure out. Yeah. We'll figure something else out. No. Yeah, well, like, all right. Good. You don't want phone. to put your yeah. top prospect yeah. in for a superstar player. Goodbye. It's, it's yeah. as simple as that. And it has to be that way. It really does. So if you are Kevin Adams and you do need to rebuild this team and you do need to trade those three guys or or you don't, you're Kevin Adams here in this scenario. Um, what's your move and um, how do you make this team a playoff team as soon as possible? And how soon could they possibly be after what we've seen all year and over the past decade? How soon can they possibly be a playoff team no matter what they do? Well, Adams feels to be a winner, and he told us this, that you need players that want to be here. So he's come right out and asked people, do you want to be here? His, his words, do you want to be part of something great? And do you want to be part of this, the, you know, of, of what we're going to do here to make the Buffalo Sabres into a viable franchise year after year? If the answer is no, and I'm sure he got some no's, then he will deal with that. So he, he, the question is, might he be the one that's looking to trade some of these guys? Because he doesn't want guys that don't want to be here. And, you know, he's gotten the answer for a lot of the young players who are excited about moving forward, seeing what they've got coming. So, no, I don't think it needs to be a long rebuild, depending on how he builds around the pieces he has, because these pieces have shown us under Don Granado that they can be very good pieces moving forward. Cousins, Middlestad, Asplund. Nobody was thinking Asplund was going to be on the team. Good now point. it looks yeah. like somebody that could be a very useful two-way player that can contribute offensively. They have too many two-way players that never contribute offensively for them. You know, a, a guy that, that you can count on that way. A very young defense core. Samuelson came up and showed us that he's ready for the National Hockey League, as are others. So, But you got to be smart in how you build around them. And if you trade those three players, if – if you didn't get what you need to get for them, he should be fired, first of all. And second of all, if you do get what their value is, 
those are going to be very key pieces to plug into the lineup around what we've already seen. From what we've seen, no, that's not a playoff team or, or by whatever that might be, but they have to do better than Skinner in the top six. To me, that's just not going to work. So that they need somebody better than him there. If Reinhardt's traded, you're going to have to replace that in the top six. I think Victor Olison, although he got better five on five as the year went on, I'm still not convinced he's a top six forward, five on five. So, you know, those are the holes that you need to fill on this team if you're going to be, and of course, goaltending. And moving forward, they also need to think about head coaching. Um, you know, I ask you this every single time we talk, but things change every t single time we talk. Is Don Granato the guy? I think he is. The only one that, in my mind, that was out there, who isn't out there yet, that would change my mind is if Rod Brindamore doesn't get a new contract with Carolina. Mm -hmm. We're hearing that they're close, but we've been hearing for two weeks now that they're close. So, um, you know, Brindamore, of course, won a Stanley Cup in Carolina. Kevin Adams knows him very well. He too won a Stanley Cup in Carolina with Brindamore. So that would be somebody that I would think Kevin Adams definitely would want if he were to become available. So for me, it's Granado unless Brenda Moore becomes available. And, and what do you think he can do for this team moving forward? Because, I, I mean, he was able to kind of like, you know, throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks this season. It was a dead season at this point. So what, what can he do moving forward with these guys? Because obviously developmentally, he's a good coach. Um, but how is he going to deal with when you get Jack Eichels in there? We didn't get to see him coach Jack, which is, is a shame because I would have liked to have seen what he could do with a Jack Eichel. Um, but, but how is he going to be with veteran players when he's new to this big of a job? Well, he was the coach of the year in American Hockey League. He won a championship in the East Coast League. Uh, and he's just been a career coach and you're right. I mean, th but that's perfect. You know, he was trying to see what would stick. That was perfect because now if he does get the job next year, he doesn't have to do that because he knows he has seen certain players in certain situations. He did an overtime where the combinations were different the whole five minutes because he wanted to see certain combinations. So now next year, when he gets in three on three overtime, he knows what combinations work and what don't. So I, I think it really helped him to be able to do that. He's not afraid to try things. He's not afraid to admit when they don't work and that you got to redo them again. But I think that's actually a plus for him that he was able to do that moving forward. Now, Jack Eichel did play for him with the uh, U S developmental team. So he's a little bit familiar with them. And that was one of the positive things Jack talked about in his uh, exit interview with us that talking to other players on the team, he said, all they heard about Don Granado were very positive things. He yeah. says, everything seems the players really seem to like what he's doing. But and, are those things uh, Jack Eichel needs to say? He needs to say that, but I, you can usually tell when Jack is, is giving you a hard, a hard time or giving he you He was very honest with us on Monday, so. Yeah, you, you, I usually can figure Jack out pretty well. I, I, I took him for his word there that, um, you know, the, talking to players, because I think players, from everything I've heard, players behind the scenes are very complimentary of Granado. They like what they've seen because Granado builds on their strengths, and they like playing that way. They don't like playing a system that they're no good at, which is what they had to do before. And they're just spinning their wheels because they can't do what they're being asked to do. Now they're being do, asked to do what they're good at. So it's, okay, player A, you're good at this. Player B, you're good at this. And player C, you're good at this. When we take that all and put it together, we're going to mesh your strengths into a system that's going to make us a better team. And, and that players like hearing that. And they were held accountable. Tage Thompson, when he was held accountable for a bad penalty, didn't pout. I think he played seven minutes the next game and maybe seven the next game. But then he got the opportunity to come back with uh, Casey Middlestat's line. And I believe at four points in his last four games, you know, he, he learned from his mistake. He didn't throw it on Granado as well. What is he doing to me? And Granado wants you mad. 
when, right. when, when he, he says does that. things like that. He, he looked, wants you uh, mad at him. So his, inter- at his exit interview, he said that to us. He said, you know, um, yeah, the guys aren't happy with what I do, but they understand why I did it. And then they keep pushing on. Whereas that just kind of didn't see, seem to be the result with Kruger. I mean, I am sure Jeff Skinner just really couldn't wrap his head around why he kept being fetched. But um, that seemed to be the result there with the guys um, under Granado is that they could see why they were, things were happening and then they got their opportunity again. The, op- the next opportunity was always there for get again and Don was giving it to them. So uh, how much does that speak to a player and like can, like I've asked you, like that stick with the older players on the team? I think they'll be fine because one mistake also doesn't put you on the bench. Whereas some coaches, you make a mistake and you never see the ice again. Now, if it's a couple in a row that happened to Cody Eakin, he had a rough first period and he saw the ice one more time, made another huge mistake. And that was the end of him. Uh, But it was, it was a bunch of mistakes combined in that game. Plus I think some other games that, that put him on the bench, but I think overall a player can't play scared that they're going to make a mistake. Rasmus Dahlin is going to make mistakes. It's just simply he's going to. And if he's afraid, and he seemed under Ralph Kruger to be afraid of making mistakes, and he would just get worse. And then he'd make more mistakes, and he'd make more mistakes, because then he starts thinking, and oh no, I, I'm going to, this happened. And he's, he played more freer under Granado that, all right, I'm going to use my strengths. Every now and then, that tightrope act he does is going to cost him. But overall, he played a much, much better game, knowing that one mistake isn't going to put him on the bench. It's going to be interesting to see what Kevin Adams does uh, coming up here to see, you know, if he sticks with Granado and um, the way that things will go and develop with him. Um, something that has to be addressed, goaltending. Yep. And um, you brought it up earlier. Um does this team have its hands tied when it comes to Lena Zolmark? Are they going to have to pay him whatever they want? Because it seems like there's really just not another option. Absolutely. Uh, you know, he's, they've always kind of one year, two years, they've never really given him a, a good, a real good contract, kind of like Reinhardt, same thing, but he does like it here. And Lena at least said when he was talking to us, if I play here next year, that'll be fine. He goes, I like Buffalo. I, I grew up here. This is the only organization I know. So he said that would be fine. And he wanted to get home to his family. So he really wasn't thinking about it. And then he's going to sit down with his agent and they'll sit down with Adams and then they'll figure it out. And this year, don't forget, it's later. It's usually July 1st. This year, it's July 28th. So they have more time to figure out before players become unrestricted free agents uh, to be able to try to negotiate a deal but Omar calls all the cards and he can tell the Sabres that's not good enough. And we'll just maybe circle back to you. We're going to become an unrestricted free agent. And if things don't work out, maybe we'll circle back to you. And I wouldn't want to pay him $5 million a year. That's what Demko got in Vancouver. I always bring that up. Right. That was a huge, yeah. That was a huge overpayment in my estimation. And I think all Mark's a better goaltender, but I still don't think all Mark is a $5 million goaltender, but is he, but they don't have the option. It? Yeah, is he willing to accept less than that? I would think not. And if you're him, why not? So, oh, a lot well, of Luke with- played better than I thought he would. And after I thought about it, I go, you know what? You should have you should have figured that out because look at all the players that got taken from the Rochester Americans because of the taxi squad and all the injuries that the Sabers had. There was a time recently where I counted five players in the Amherst lineup that were under right. contract with the Buffalo Sabres. The rest were guys on tryout contracts who came up from the East coast league or had American league deals. So that makes a little bit of sense. Maybe why Lukanen's numbers were so bad in the American hockey league. He really didn't have an American hockey league team in front of him. So you know, right. I think he showed us what he could do in the NHL. Does that mean you want him backing up all Mark next year? Well, yeah, if they're going to split games, but if he's only going to you get want him to play games, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you want him down in Rochester playing every day. 
Yeah, it's understandable. And it's a, a lot to figure out. Uh, Kevin Adams is going to be a very busy man <laughs> the next few weeks, as if he hasn't been this entire season. Uh, Paul Hamilton, as always, thank you so much for your insight. And thanks for joining me. And thanks for having me on.